Okay. Good morning, everybody. This is a new colloquia from the Severo Chua program. Today, uh, we will have the talk by Dr. Esther Muro from Grenoble uh, University in France. And she will talk on the formation of, uh, of a sterile cluster. What does the spatial distribution reveal? So now Isabel Marquez uh, will introduce Esther. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, René. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for being here again to, uh, to follow our Severo Ochoa Colloquia, Weblockia uh, program. Um, it's a pleasure today to, to have uh, Stan Moreau, and um, I'd like to acknowledge all of you to, for, for being here uh, to, to listen to her. So, um, uh, Stan Moreau has a permanent position at the Institut de Planetology d'Astrophysique de Grenoble in France since uh, 2005, when she became associate professor. Uh, she did her PhD in Grenoble on, on the substellar initial mass function of young open clusters under the supervision of uh, Jérôme Bouvier. Uh, that was a final in 2003. She then spent uh, two years at the um, Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge, uh, in the United Kingdom, as a postdoctoral researcher, where she worked with uh, Cathy Clark on the dynamical evolution of young clusters uh, using n-body simulations. Her main research interest uh, uh, is the formation and evolution of um, young clusters and associations. And she deals with the characterization of the low uh, mass star population in clusters, in particular the initial mass function, multiplicity rotation, and spatial and kinematic distribution, in order to constrain the outcome of star formation and understand the heritage from the gas phase. Her research work uh, aims at constraining the formation of star clusters by combining observational studies of their stellar population and numerical simulations of their early dynamical evolution. She co-leads uh, the Star Formation Mapper Project of the European uh, Hor Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programs. Uh, she was also the PI of the Young Researcher Project Desk, that's okay. from Dynamical Evolution of Young Star Clusters, from the French Agence Nationale de la Recherche, so the equivalent to our uh, Spanish uh, national agency. She is involved in large ground-based observational surveys to measure proper motions like uh, DUNS and radial velocities like Gaia, ISO survey and WEAVE in order to complement the information provided uh, uh, from, from Gaia. All these questions are central to the talk she's giving us today as you will see in a minute. And, uh, but before starting, I'd like to thank the, uh, Dr. Moreau for accepting our invitation for this web webblockium from the Severo Chua program. And, uh, and also I'd like to extend uh, this invitation to visit us at the IAEA in the near future, I hope. So thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you, Isabel, for the introduction. And, um, and, um, and also thank you for the invitation. So thank you to, to Emilio for inviting me. And uh, yeah, that's a pity that this um, <clears throat> seminar will be, you know, uh, in remote, but uh, hopefully next time indeed, as you were saying, Isabel, I wish I would uh, be able to come to visit all of you uh, in Canada. Okay, so I will um, talk now about, um, I mean, recent work that uh, we did uh, with, um, in, in Grenoble with our group. So it's uh, the people, I mean, the, the, the Results I will present here, basically are the work from um, Isabel Juncourt, Marta Gonzalez, which uh, I mean, I think maybe some of you may know because she's a postdoc and now with us in Grenoble. Um, Thomas Noni, who he was a PhD student, uh, uh, postdoc Jean-François Robitaille, a new PhD student, Benjamin Thomason, Frédéric Mott, she's also part of this group, and uh, Johan Puto, who is uh, a PhD student as well. So I will, um, and also most of the work that uh, indeed uh, I will present today actually is part of the, the work that we did um, in the framework of the Star for Mapper project, which was a European project um, funding from, I mean, 2016 to 2020, basically, well, 2021 actually, just in 2020, yeah, just finishes, uh, we just finished this project this summer. So I will talk about um, spatial distribution of young, uh, uh, of young 
stellar uh, objects in clusters. And I will focus on uh, basically trying to understand what it uh, reveals, what it tells us about the formation of stellar cluster. So, um, yeah, so, but what do we know uh, nowadays about star formation? So uh, we know it is now very well established that actually most stars form in groups. I mean, when I'm saying groups, it can be, you know, uh, any groups between like 10 stars or even very large clusters containing uh, millions of stars. But we know that actually only uh, about 10% um, of them are going to survive for more than 10 million years. And uh, because basically they are the objects that are gravitationally bound. And that, that's uh, the, these objects are called the, the stellar clusters. But there's still some lots of questions to know exactly how they form and um, how they evolve. And indeed that's my main uh, research interest here. And um, so I will just show you right now just um, one of the first numerical simulation that actually was uh, performed by Matthew Bates. So this is a very old, well, fairly old one in 2003. And um, so what you can see is that you start actually with just um, a large molecular cloud. And then he just put some turbulent um, motion in here. Uh, uh, and uh, there is absolutely no feedback, no magnetic field in this very first simulation. So now the simulation has improved a lot. But uh, what we can see, and it was a kind of a new thing at that time, is that actually the, this, this tubular fragmentation was able to form filaments, which has then been, been also reveal, revealed by um, Herschel. And uh, what was very striking from this simulation is that it looks very, very um, dynamical and probably too much because since then, I mean, now that we included uh, that magnetic field has been included and uh, feedback and so on, uh, it is a little bit less dynamic. But here you can see, I mean, in the simulation, so you can see the white points are actually sink particles, so meaning uh, basically new stars. And you can really see that there, there has been a lot of interaction. And uh, here we are going to zoom, for example, on this, um, on a denser spot, you can see a very large disk around the star that is going to fragment and um, it's going to form lots and lots of stars that will interact um, with each other and there are lots of ejection and so on. So again, as I was saying, this is probably a bit too dynamic, huh? but nevertheless, there, also, there has also been uh, new observations, recent observations in molecular clouds that have um, uh, reveal these gas inflows at large scale, but also at small scale. And uh, all of these uh, new results in the um, early, well, early 2000, and, you know, the, the few years after, uh, led to a new paradigm of star formation that is uh, very, uh, is much more dynamic compared to what we, we thought originally, I would say. Um, therefore, when the, the one of the questions that uh, we may ask is, uh, I mean, what we can see from the observations and the simulations, is that there is a very complex interplay between the gas and the star during this uh, cluster formation. And there are still lots of questions that are still um, debated today. And um, so one of them, for example, is about uh, spatial and climatic stru structures of young stellar objects. Um, we think that they are inherited from the gas but uh, like you know, the substructures, mass segregations, but what is the effect of dynamics exactly also on these uh, structures? What is the effect also of stellar feedback? feedback? And this is questions that are not completely solved today. Um, there are also a very important question is the question of the initial mass function. When exactly are stellar masses uh, determined? Is it already in the gas phase? You know, is it just what is, so the main question basically is what is the link between the core mass function and the stellar initial mass function? Is it just a, a scaling between the two or, or is it more than that? And in particular, uh, when we make this comparison between the core mass function and the initial mass function, we often forget about fragmentation. And we don't know much about fragmentation and in particular about the origin of and the formation of, um, of, of multiple systems. And um, also there are lots of, I mean, um, um, claim to say that actually some of the young stellar objects are, properties are universal, like the IMF, for example. 
And if this is the case, then why? Because if indeed uh, it is very dynamic, then we expect actually uh, somehow the um, properties of these young stars to depend on the uh, on the local environment and on the yeah on the on the properties of the molecular clouds from which they are formed. So in order to um, address this question, then uh, it's um, we can obviously look at observations, but to make the link between the series and the observation is not so easy. It's not straightforward, I would say, because if you look at these simulations here on the, so this is just, uh, again, a snapshot um, on the left is um, uh, the outcome of, um, of an SPH simulation. Uh, that actually, the, one of the main problems of this kind of simulation is that's because they are very, co um, uh, they take a lot of time, you know, in terms of CPU time, and they stop very early in the evolution of the cluster. So just after a few free fold times, so basically here, it's uh, only after you know less than one million year, and as I was saying before, what you have at the end is sink particles. They are not real stars in the sense that actually, it's very often it's just a threshold in terms of density. And then they stop here, and then we let, we try to compare what comes out from these simulations to the observations. But if you look at what we well, what we can see in in, in these uh, young star forming regions, like here, this is the Orion, and so on. The, right hand side. Uh, it's a cluster that has already one million year or maybe a bit more. Uh, the region is much larger than what we see usually in the simulations. Um, and uh, even though, you know, it's all, so it's basically uh, at a stage that is older than what uh, that the outcome of the simulations. And still, uh, we cannot go very much um, earlier because of extinction, where there is still a lot of extinction. And if we want to determine also the mass of the stars, it's very difficult at these very young edges, uh, mainly because of this evolutionary model that are very uncertain. And it's difficult to relate these two. We cannot make a co direct comparison. Because in particular, so for example, in the, the simulation, this, this stop kind of artificially, the accretion has not finished yet. Feedback often is not uh, included, included, although it is starting to be included now. But there is also uh, some dynamical evolution that is going to occur in these embedded clusters. And uh, when you remove the gas, also it can have lots of uh, consequences. And also the multiple systems are going to decay very, very uh, rapidly. So what we observe is not, cannot be di directly compared. So how can we do then to bring constraint, you know, um, on, a, on the star formation theory? And um, I think nevertheless, we, what we need to do is really to try to characterize as much as possible the young, well, the stellar properties, sorry, the stellar population properties in uh, young clusters and star forming regions. So as early as we can and compare them with what we observe for the gas. So, the main uh, properties in this we can look at is the, the initial mass function, and indeed I, I did my PhD on this topic, the multiple systems, you know, and then we can compare with the core mass function and also the multiplicity of cores. But what I will focus on today, more specifically, is uh, about the spatial distribution of these uh, young stellar objects uh, in, in clusters. And as I, as I said, uh, already, it's the work that uh, was done in the framework of this uh, Star for Mapper project. Okay, so um, now just a few words also before um, going a bit more into detail is that if we want to characterize a spatial distribution, then we need to have tools to, to do this characterization. And there have been a lot of, I mean, uh, a bunch of uh, of algorithm and um, parameters that has, have been developed to do this uh, to do this task, and I will just here I just um, put a, a few here that I will uh, I will talk about some of them. It's not uh, exhaustive here because there has been a lot of work here in this uh, in, so for for this as I was saying to develop this all these tools, but just a few words. So if we want, so for example, if you're interested in uh, well, knowing the global properties of your uh, of your of your region. So, for example, if you want to know whether it is clustered or concentrated, then so there is a, a parameter that is is called the Q parameter that's been introduced by uh, by Cartwright and Whitworth in 2004. 
And um, so this is uh, very often used uh, right now. So basically, uh, it's just a way to measure uh, the clustering uh, of, your, of your regions. Um, so that's for the global properties. You can obviously look at other things like correlation function or nearest neighbor distance uh, statistics. If you're interested in, in the knowing whether, you know, uh, to have individual properties of stars in your cluster, then you can use, uh, for example, the local density. And then uh, there has been a new work by Anne Buckner has been published last year, for example, to uh, define a clustering index for each individual star. Uh, that is basically the ratio of this local density of the sample compared to that of a, of a uniform distribution. Then if you want to look at the mass segregation, there has been so the lambda parameter, I will uh, talk about it later on. There are also other other possibility to, to look at, like using this uh, local density and the mass. Uh, and also a very important um, um, topic that is, uh, well, a lot of work that's been done recently is really how to detect uh, substructures uh, in clusters. And I will talk also about that uh, later. Okay, so now let's come back to this uh, spatial distribution and I will try to show you that, I mean, uh, what can it, what does it tell us about the stellar formation history in the region that uh, you're interested in? And I will uh, talk in particular about uh, NGC 2264, and I will present you the recent results that we obtained in this uh, in this region, just well, but mainly as an example. So, as I was saying before, so what is important really is to try to compare the star uh, spatial distribution to the gas one, and uh, there has been quite lots of work already uh, done on this um, subject, and we can see that most of the time there is a, actually a, a pretty good correlation between the the gas uh, in the star forming region and, uh, and the star location. So here on the left, this is just to show you, this is an image of the Aquila region, so it's a tertiary image. And what you see, so in, um, in orange, you have filaments and uh, when they are dense, they become very dense, they become black, uh, sorry, white. And um, you can see that actually in the densest part of the, when the denser filament, that's where you can find the cores that are uh, actually blue triangles here. So we can see a really, I mean, a, a clear correlation uh, saying, indicating that actually star formation occurs in this filament. Uh, and um, if you look also, for example, at a, a PPV diagram, like in Orion, that is a work by uh, Alpha Rocker in 2016, you can also see that, I mean, here, so this is position, position, and velocity in the line of sight. And um, so uh, you have the, the gas basically in the in yellow and green, and you have, uh, and uh, well, in colors, and you have all the stars are as uh, triangles here. And again, you can see that the correlation is pretty good. It's not perfect though, but it's definitely pretty good. So there is definitely a correlation, which is kind of uh, expected as uh, in, since indeed we expect to have this formation inside these filaments. But then if you look um, also, uh, so that's uh, some work by Gutzer Mus in 2011, which you look at a little bit in more details, what you can see for the, these young stellar objects is that in fact you have, um, very often you have substructures, so small groups of stars, with containing between like you know, 10 up to 100 of stars. And uh, very often this, um, uh, these groups have quite a high stellar density and they are they usually correlate pretty well uh, with the filamentary structure but uh, there is also a distributed population uh, that we can see in in, in all star forming regions and uh, there has been some claims i mean to say that actually this distributed population may be older than the population that we can see in groups uh, okay, so this is, for example, I will show you some sketch. Uh, this is um, from the paper from Getman and collaborators in 2014. And to, to see what is the relation between the age spread and the presence of a distributed population. And actually the authors, they proposed, um, so here is just three different scenarios 
about uh, of star forming regions to also explain this kind of uh, distributed population around um, let's say younger and uh, more concentrated uh, star so one of the scenario the scenario the first scenario a on the on the left is basically is just to say that for example in fact you have star formation starting at some point everywhere in your cloud and then in the periphery that's why you have um, less uh, gas or the gas is less dense therefore you you don't have the reservoir is not um, is exhausted earlier in the periphery compared to uh, the center of the of your cloud so you start you continue to have star formation in the center while the star formation has, end, has uh, ended uh, in the outskirts. So that's uh, one scenario that has been proposed. Another scenario is this uh, formation of, uh, you know, within subclusters, you have various subclusters that are going to form, but form at different uh, time. So you, again, you will have a star formation that will last for several million years. And then the first subclusters will just expand. And, and especially because of the, the when the gas is removed from these um, small subclusters, and when you have this expansion, then you, at the end you end up again with uh, concentration of young stars surrounded by a slightly older population. population. Another scenario is um, uh, much more dynamics. Is where you can here you will have okay. Uh, a potential well on your molecular clouds, you will form stars where the gas is denser. And then and you have filaments that actually converging towards this potential well. And um, the stars uh, will form basically, they will, the, the new stars that are forming, they will converge towards this uh, potential well. And again, at the end, you have this, you end up with this uh, uh, distributed population of older stars around a concentrated um, clump of uh, younger stars. So that's different possibility to explain this um, this uh, difference, you know, between the um, spatial distribution between younger and older stars. And um, so I will now just show exactly how whether we are able to distinguish um, some of these uh, scenarios. Uh, looking, for example, at NGC 2264. So NGC 2264 is um, relatively massive uh, star forming regions. Uh, there is actually one O star that is S1 here at the top, and it's located at about 700 parsecs uh, uh, from the sun. Uh, the edge spread is between four and five million years, which is fairly typical from, uh, for star forming regions. And uh, there has been um, a lot of uh, work already on this, uh, I mean, so very well studied regions. And there has been some claim for a gradient of star formation from the north to the south. And uh, also um, recent results looking more particularly at the gas uh, have um, shown that actually the gas cloud is very uh, dynamical and that there is indeed uh, gas inflow towards the, the center of this um, of NGC 2264. And it's in particular, you have gas inflow towards IRS 2 and IRS 1 here in the center. So this picture here is, is um, um, Herschel image, I mean, Pax and Spire. So here, this is just a combination of, of uh, different uh, wavelengths to have this nice color image. And it comes from this um, Hobby's large survey and uh, Frédéric Mott working in Grenoble is, is actually the, the PI of this survey. And so we just used this data set to, um, well, to look at the, um, at the core population and then to compare the core population to the young stellar population in this region. So what we did first uh, with this Herschel data is that we, we first looked at the global statistics of the gas um, of the gas of the of, of the clouds and uh, the main reason to do that is to at, at the end to see whether we could really distinguish different regions within these uh, clusters so what has been done is that actually we used well we did some wavelet analysis using mng seg which is um, a method developed by jean-francois robitaille who is working 
in Grenoble. So it's, it's just a way to separate the coherent structure, so mainly, namely the filaments and the cores from the diffuse medium. And, um, and then he looked at these uh, current structures at different scale. So here, this is on, again on the on the on the left. You can see the the power spectra of the current part uh, of the MNG seg at different scales. So you can see here the scale here, and uh, the you have three different um, slopes here that they actually correspond to uh, three different regions. That are uh, that have been uh, separated actually using this analysis. So you, we define the center here, the north part and the southern part, and we can see that actually most of the uh, power is actually in, in the center of um, of this um, of the region. Again, basically saying that actually you have more uh, cores and filaments in the center. So we used this analysis to divide this region into three main regions. And then we, um, we extracted the cores. So we first uh, built the column density map, which has a resolution of 18 hexagons. And we extracted the cores uh, using um, GetSF, which is, I don't know if, I mean, if some of you, some of you are familiar with get sources, it's basically a new version of uh, get sources. Um, and uh, so, Using this GetSF, we extracted uh, a bit more than 250 cores, and the catalog is available on the Star Mapper we website. And uh, here this is just a zoom. You can see that actually we have well, we have cores more or less everywhere, but uh, with a very large uh, concentration in, in the center. And we can already see that actually there is lots of I mean there is a distributed population of cores with some um, concentrated parts in the, in the center. And so this motivated us to look at the mass segregation of the core. So um, we use this lambda parameter. So the lambda parameter is basically using this, the, the minimum spanning tree uh, between cores. And then we looked at the, um, the distance <coughs> of, of the massive, or the, the, the length of the branches uh, for the massive stars uh, when compared to um, random offsets uh, with the same number of stars basically uh, inside the, in, in the region. And if this parameter is larger than one, then it means that actually we, there is some mass segregation. So it means that actually the massive objects are more compact, uh, are more concentrated uh, to each other. And we can really see a, a fairly high level of mass segregation in this region. And um, so, and more, so the, moreover, what we have seen here is that actually uh, the mass segregation comes mainly, I mean, the main uh, from the center region, which is in black, and in blue and, and red, you have the north and the southern region. So the mass segregation is only present in the center, but actually that's where you have the most massive cores. And actually, all of them uh, are bound. And um, so this really um, <clears throat> points toward the fact that actually uh, there is a real uh, cluster of cores in the center of the region that is uh, actually uh, forming stars. Okay, the cores inside the centers are bound and therefore are going to form stars. And that's where you have most of the star formation, formation at the moment. And then what we did is that we looked at the core and, um, and we compared the young stellar object with the core uh, spatial distribution. So here you can see this is the, again, the map, well, um, a plot of the region where you have the ellipses shows all the cores that we, we have. So the 256 cores. Then in blue, we have the class zero and one uh, stars. And uh, in red, uh, the class two stars. And this uh, actually came from the catalog from Rapson and collaborators. And we can already see just by eye that actually most of the class zero and one photostars are located in the center, although you have some uh, outside as well. And then the class two, on you have class two stars concentrated in the center. In the north, they look to be more spread. And in the south, uh, there is almost no class two stars uh, actually when compared to 
you know, the other uh, cores and, and, uh, and class zero and one. So how can we actually now quantify this? And uh, so what we did is that we first, we looked, we used a, a simple statistic. So we looked at the nearest neighbor distance uh, distribution. And uh, so here, the, this is a plot of the, I mean, we look at the distance between the class zero stars, class zero and one stars to cores. And here, this is the inverse, meaning that actually we look at the distance of the cores to the class zero and one, okay? So what we can see is that actually the mean distance between uh, any class zero to a core is, is very low, is of the order of um, 0.1 parsec. And uh, it's actually of the about the size of the, of the core itself. So this really tells us something, meaning that actually this class zero and one poster stars are still associated to their parental um, club, clump and cores, basically. However, if you look at, I mean, the, the, if you look at the cores themselves, uh, then the, in average, their distance to the to a class zero and one protostars is much larger. It's about one parsec, meaning that actually the, you have a lot of cores that actually that are not associated to this class zero and one. And actually, these cores are mainly unborn, meaning that actually they are not going to form cores, uh, stars uh, yet, at least. And uh, we see also better correlation between club, between the cores and the class two stars. But what this tells us is that uh, what we this actually suggests a dynamical scenario of star formation. So that would be the you know the third scenario that was proposed, for example, by Getman and collaborators, meaning that actually very pro we have a um, uh, cores that may be uh, falling into the, the center, into the ridge uh, of NDC 2264, where they are going to form stars. And once the stars have been formed, then you will have some expansion. And that's why actually at, at the end, you have this uh, class two stars that are very spread, especially in the north. And indeed, if you look also at the um, surface density of class two stars, class zero one, uh, or and uh, bound cores, and if you hear what we did is that we normalized this surface density to the life, lifetime of each object. So we took basically 2 million years for class two and 0.2 and 0.3 million years for each uh, other object. And uh, we looked at the, at the, um, at the ratio of uh, this surface density, of this normalized surface density for class two, class zero one and, and cause. And what you can see is that in the north region, we have something that is more or less uh, equal. In the center, there is a large, well, um, I mean, the main population that dominate is really the class zero one and the, and the cores. So really meaning that actually you have uh, star formation ongoing in the center. And in the south, there is, um, well, tentative, let's say, um, a bit more of cores compared to class zero one and almost no class two. But this means that actually maybe in the south, we will um, see um, in, the, well, in, the, in the future um, star formation in this region. So there is all this, um, um, all this work basically just confirm this sequential star formation from the north to the south. But here we have uh, means actually to quantify this. Okay, I will now just um, so switch um, from the star, star formation um, history in NDC 2264 and talk a bit more about substructures. And I will focus, you will see on the small scale substructures and uh, to see uh, whether we can have some um, clues about the fermentation process of the molecular cloud. And uh, I will, uh, for this, I will uh, talk about the work that we did in Taurus. But before that, I would like first to stress uh, well, uh, some questions on when we want to look for substructures, it's not uh, a very easy task and there are lots of ways to actually look for substructures. But what I really think is important is first to, I mean, we should not look for substructures in regions where uh, it does not exist. Well, it sounds obvious, but sometimes I mean, it's, it's also good to say. So there is, we, I think, I really think that we first need to assess uh, the clustering tendency of your data set. So for example, using, well, either just looking at it, just, if you see real clumps, then you can be sure that there are things to, 
to look for, but um, a, a nice indicator to use is this Q parameter. And I will come back to this uh, after. Or you could also use other statistics like the Hopkins statistics or so on. But it's important to first know whether indeed uh, your reagent is, is clustered or not. Then came the question to know what exactly tools to use to look for substructures. And this actually depends a lot on, on, on the questions and uh, you want to solve and on the scale that you're in interested in. But what is important is actually whatever method you want to use is you need to, I mean, you have to um, have as um, less prior as possible. So meaning that actually you should look for any shape of structures, like uh, arbitrary shape. Uh, you need to be able to handle noise and outliers, so just to allow uh, stars not to belong to any substructures. And also, if possible, if you're interested in, in, in the full hierarchy of your regions, then you need a tool that is able also to, to handle this. And then what is important to do as well is really to test the validity of the cluster. So for example, uh, how can you be sure that actually the number of clusters that you have detected is, is, is correct? Or that's, I mean, you have to run tests at the end to really try to to, to understand that. And this is, uh, well, there are a few, that's what we did, for example, in Taurus. I will not detail that, but I really think that um, sometimes we forget about that and we put too, we are too confident into the, the tools that we are using, but we shouldn't really uh, test the validity of the cluster that has, be, has been found. So to identify substructures, so um, I talked about the Q parameter. So, as I was, so this is just an example, for example, of the chameleon uh, regions. And this is the minimum spanning tree. And, the min and from the minimum spanning tree, you can uh, compute this Q parameter where, uh, so you have the, basically the mean uh, branch length of your, uh, of your tree compared to the mean separation uh, between stars inside your sample. And so if it is less than 0.8, then you can say that your uh, region is, is substructures. And then a way, for example, to look for groups is just to make a cut at a given length for, of your branches and to say of, to, that you would then identify some groups. But you, by doing that, then you have some questions, for example, to know whether you see, uh, you can find some very small groups to know whether or not they belong to another. And it's it really depends basically on the on the on the length threshold that you are you are using. Uh, so there are some other um, methods that can be used. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. So this is just a parametric mixture uh, models, and I will more focus about what we used. Is actually we used um, a partition clustering method based on density, and in particular we used the Debescan algorithm that allows to group together. Uh, neighbor points, so for example, the, the green points here, uh, as soon as they have a minimum density, and this density is determined by uh, epsilon, which gives you a radius, and n, which is a number of points that you want to have inside this radius. And uh, this um, method has advantages in the sense that it has no a priori number of clusters, no a priori on shapes, it can handle noise, the only uh, disadvantage or well, inconvenient, I would say, is that actually there is only one density threshold used uh, by DBSCAN, and I will come back to that later on. So what we did is that, uh, so we used this algorithm and uh, our goal was really to look for the smallest over densities with uh, okay, a high level of significance above random. Uh, the reason why we look for the smallest over densities is because really we were interested in you know, trying to to, to see uh, really, uh, well, to find the uh, imprints of star formation and look at very small scales to see whether we could um, constrain the fragmentation process. So to determine this scale, epsilon, then we use the one point correlation function. This is just basically, it gives you the, this is just the probability, I mean, compared to random, uh, to have a, a, your first neighbor um, you know, um, so you here you have an excess of neighbor at a given, uh, well, and this scales below epsilon when compared to random. So it basically will give you the end of the of the binary regime, and then you can expect that afterwards you will really look for for clusters. So this this is the minimum length to look for substructures, 
And then we have chosen n min uh, in order to make sure that actually the detected structures uh, have a degree of significance that is more than three sigma above random expectation. And um, so Marta Gonzalez did a lot of work uh, on this uh, procedure to make sure that actually it can work on uh, any uh, kind of distribution on fractal, radial, and, and primer. And um, so we ended up with a really uh, homogeneous, robust and uh, method. And that is obviously optimized for st structure distribution. But even though, you know, for radial distribution, where there is really no real point to look for, for structures, this um, procedure is working uh, pretty well. And this is just an illustration in, in her paper that has just been recently um, accepted. Uh, the so illustration of the of this uh, procedure on four star forming regions, so in Taurus, and I will discuss the results uh, a little bit later. In IC348, which is more like a um, concentrated region in upper score, and here this is Carina, but I, will, I won't have time to, to get into detail too much into, into this. But Carina is very complex regions, and this, this is comparison with other, with previous work. And uh, well, you can see that we recover basically uh, most of the structures that has been found before. And um, yeah, I will just skip that maybe for later if there, there is a question. But I would just would like to point out that actually, so this, um, uh, so all this procedure has been developed and now we have a really a, a software that is, um, available to the community. So it's called S2D2 for small scale significant DB scan detection. And uh, you can find this uh, software as well as the documentation on the Star for Mapper website. And there is also uh, different Im implementations, but there is a link you will see on this web page uh, where you can run it. There is a uh, graphic interface. So for a very friendly user uh, interface, but you can, so, you can also download Python or or or, or uh, code to run it uh, yourself on your on your on, on your computer, and the catalog are also available and again on the Staff Marker website. So anyway, what did we get in Taurus? So this is um, so with this procedure, we were able to detect uh, so twenty small groups. They are re represented here in color. What we can see that they are all of them are located along the filaments. About half of the stars are within the nest, the nest, well, we call them nests for nested elementary structures. You also have some distributed populations. And these nests are actually, you know, quite um, fairly dense, even though we always say that uh, Taurus is not a dense region. But actually, if you look at the, these, uh, these small structures, you can reach a dense stellar density that is larger than uh, several hundreds of stars per parsec square. And most of these nests have a um, prolate uh, morphology. Now, if you look at the, um, if you take also the, an edge proxy, um, looking at the classification of your star, you know, class one, class two, and class three, and look at the, the content of each uh, star inside this nest, then we can see that actually what we have found is that most of the class zero and one are contained in, in nests which really means that actually we have um, identified the preferred site of star formation in Taurus. But none, of, none, I mean, some of them are a little bit older, I mean, uh, statistically, because they have mainly uh, class two and three stars inside them, meaning that they are actually getting infertile, but still they are still there, meaning that they did not have time to disperse. Uh, which actually uh, is, saying, is telling us that actually Taurus is not very dynamic and rather pristine. And that's also probably why, I mean, why one of the reasons why we were interested in this particular region. And the, the morphology of this nest uh, is telling us also that actually, um, since it is prolate and the, in the direction following the, um, the filaments, these favor actually a fairly rapid uh, star formation uh, inside the nest. So this points towards um, another kind of um, scenario for star formation in Taurus, meaning that actually here we're probably um, seeing a star formation that is, is occurring within nests, and we don't see any global infall as in NGC 2264. 
So that's mainly because the two, these two regions are very different. But this can be seen uh, directly in the spatial distribution. What it tells us as well is that if you look at the um, number of stars that you have inside the, each nest as a function of the size of the nest, we, we do see a kind of a bimodal uh, relation. And what we propose is actually uh, we are, what we are seeing here is uh, correspond to two different regimes of fragmentation. One regime when you have a few stars, like you know, uh, in average five stars, that would be a fragmentation of a single core with a small uh, size. And here you will, could have for the largest um, objects, largest, largest nest with larger number of stars, it would be a fragmentation of few cores that would be already uh, specially clustered. And this analysis was also supported by the analysis of the white uh, uh, multiple system properties in, in Taurus, and where we see that actually we have um, um, the multiplicity of your system uh, decreases with the separation, meaning that actually the well, when I'm saying white system, it means that actually it's for systems that have separation larger than a thousand of AU. And uh, when you have this uh, separa separation of Fourier system that is around 1,000 of AU up to 10,000 of AU, you have fairly large multiplicity. But for larger um, separation, then the multiply is becoming less. You only have two objects, for example, instead of five. And, uh, and what we also have found is that actually this, um, you know, more compact um, systems are also more massive. And this, and we proposed to explain this, basically a cascade fragmentation where we, we would have the densest and more massive cores that would produce a higher multiplicity system. In order to um, test this, what we are now doing, this is work also from, this is the PhD from Benjamin Thomasson, that, and especially to compare, to go further in the comparison between the um, clustering of, uh, I mean, the nests that we have found for the stars and, uh, and the cores, what we are now looking for the clustering of cores. So, but uh, taking into account the fact that cores are not just uh, point sources, so this is what uh, okay, I'm not going to explain that, but we are the, the one direction we are going is really to compare this clustering of core of cores in blue with the the nest that we obtain for the stars. So this is in NGC two two six four one. This um, these two images, and another way we are investigating at the moment is really to look at the to try to find the scale of fragmentation by analyzing uh, the different. Uh, Herschel images at different wavelengths that correspond to basically different scale. Okay, and uh, so I'm, <clears throat> I'm I'm finished. So I will just give you some uh, conclusions and take home message. Uh, so what uh, I, I try to to show here is that a really a, a spatial distribution of uh, young stars in clusters is a proxy but only indirect for the star formation theory. And uh, you really need to take also the dynamical evolution into account and to take into account also the edge effect. But if you combined uh, the spatial distribution with the edge indicators, so for example, if you look at this, um, you know, sequence uh, between the cores, class zero, class one, class two, then you can really probe the history of star formation of your regions. And uh, again, I used NGC2264 to show that actually in this region we do find a sequential star formation from the north to south. And also when you compare um, the gas to the young stellar objects uh, spatial distribution, this may uh, reveal you actually, uh, this may well give you um, some hint about the dynamics of the regions. And uh, so for example, in NGC2264, uh, we see that actually the cores, I mean, they may converge towards the center before forming stars actually. Uh, while that's not at all what we are uh, seeing in the, in Taurus. And, um, but what is important is really here now we, with all the statistical tools that have been developed, there are ways to, to really quantify this effect. And also if you look at these small scale structures in environments that actually are still uh, pristine or not very much evolved dynamically, 
then it may shed some light on the sh on the cloud fermentation process. And uh, indeed, in Taurus, for example, uh, we can see that there is a, a preferential uh, cloud, well, formation inside nest, and that uh, some of them actually uh, that um, correspond to a fermentation of a single core, and that inside this core you will have you will see really a cascade fermentation for these uh, most massive cores. And um, okay, and just to as I told you before, the problem, well, not a problem, but an inconvenient when uh, using dbscan like we did here, is that we were using only one scale. But actually, uh, if you really want to get um, a full hierarchical picture of your regions, and you re if you really want to detect all the structures inside regions that are uh, more complex, where you see some um, density gradient, for example, or this kind of thing, then you, we, you really need to go towards a multi-scale analysis. And um, so that's now what also uh, work, into pro in work in progress at the moment. So just to show you the kind of thing you can do is that, for example, even with dbscan, if you run dbscan at different scale, then you can at the end build a cluster. So this is a cluster that we obtained for Taurus. So for example, for the nest, we just took one, just one given epsilon. So it just would just correspond to a cut inside this, um, th this graph here. But what is very interesting is that uh, when you're building your, your tree here, uh, then you can really look at the relevant structures by keeping only um, you know, these structures that, that last for quite a while. And then at the end, you really have in Taurus all the relevant structures at all scales uh, based from this uh, analysis of this, uh, of this cluster tree. And uh, yeah, and, uh, and, and again, I think it has uh, more to tell us about, uh, you know, how this, how um, this formation or, I mean, how, why we have this clustering and, and how, and then we will be able to also to compare regions to regions and, and really try to understand better the different um, uh, scenario of star formation in different regions. Thank you. I will stop here. Thank you very much, Stella. Still. And uh, for all the participants, the, the talk now is open for questions. Uh, I think Emilio Alfaro will uh, manage. Uh, to do so. Emilio, if you open the participant menu inside your camera, the button of your micro on, the, on your camera, you will see how is, uh, uh, who is asking for questions. Okay. All the I participants. See me. All right, right now. Yep. Well, I don't see any question in the chat so far. Here is one. Well, not in the chat. Okay. For the participants, if you don't want to ask your question, you can write in the chat box. And we see one hand raise it from Isabel. Ah, from Isabel. All right. Okay. Okay. So go ahead. Yeah. Um, um, congratulations, Stella. It has been, I mean, great, made so much information and uh, uh, with so complicated things to do that I mean and I've, I've been quite a bit overwhelmed but and I'm not an expert at all of the, in this field I, I work on, on galaxies so so as you can imagine I'm completely uh, out of the field I mean I'm not an expert at all so I'm, I'm asking you something that I've, I've been uh, read about using a kind of uh, uh, phylogeny or phylogenetic or something like that to, to, to analyze the uh, structure at large scale uh, scale, uh, at large scales for, for galaxies. So uh, I don't know where uh, what you're doing has something related to that uh, kind of analysis or if not, if you think that, that this could be used. Well, I, um, let's say that the, um, the methods are, are, are pretty similar indeed. I mean, when you look at large structures, you first need to, to, to find these structures. And uh, so, in in some ways, you know, we can you can find uh, similar um, tools 
um, to detect these kind of structures. But here, um, it's, we were really looking at a very, very different scale in the sense that actually we were looking at the smallest structures within uh, star forming regions. And uh, we were, basically we were trying to look for, uh, so the work I presented in Taurus, we were really looking for, you know, the seeds of, of, star, formi of star formations. And, uh, uh, and so in that sense, it's, it's going to be um, quite different. Although, yeah, um, it, it is related, of course, because then if you look, uh, I said that the scale is, is, is very different, but if you look at, you know, these large scale structures in, and the uh, formation of galaxies and stuff like that, uh, you, you might actually um, uh, try to look for the same kind of thing as well. It would be not the formation of star, but more the formation of galaxies. So the, 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 again, the, the sites of formation for, for galaxies. So this is related, but the questions, of course, is, uh, is very different. Yeah, yeah, of course. It's just a question of methodology, whereas I mean, I was asking if it could be used to do... To yeah, it can be used, yeah, for right. sure. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you. Okay. There is another question by Prieto. Please, yeah. get out. Hello, good, uh, good morning. Almudena Prieto. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I have a bit related question, a little bit related to, to the former uh, question. When we talk about clusters, stellar clusters uh, in general in the star galaxy or in our galaxy as well, are big structures. And you, you are talking about cores that are forming along filaments. So I would interpret since star formation in the universe, mostly we know is through, pass through stellar clusters, formation of stellar clusters. So these filaments and cores might be part of one of these big structures we call usually the stellar clusters, a big massive 10 to the four solar masses or 10 to the three solar masses with many, many, many stars. So how do you see the jump from these filaments cores to forming the more symmetric structure are all, uh, as we call general stellar clusters, just a merging of these cores, but on the other hand, cores fragmentated in stars, uh, are these filaments um, together um, merging? Um, we see also in the Milky Way, many filaments, they are devoid of stars or devoid of cores, at least obviously. So uh, how is the, the jump? Yes, so what I can, um, indeed what I can um, maybe show, is that if you look at um, young, I mean, star forming regions that are going to form clusters, and you, you do see um, structures everywhere. And um, okay, but what I can, to answer your questions, maybe I can show you this. So this is, again, just a simulation, uh, I mean, from Richard Parker and collaborator. And um, a way to explain maybe the, you know, the difference between uh, clusters and associations, uh, like, you know, Taurus is, is more uh, is, is like an association, is the sense that it, it is unbound and you still see uh, some clumps of aggregates of stars, let's say. And if you look at Orion, for example, it's more like it's uh, stellar clusters in the sense, I, I, uh, as you were saying, I mean, with a, a large um, 10 to the three solar masses or even 10 to the four solar masses and it's much more concentrated. And here, what I think uh, we, we, uh, the way you can explain this uh, formation of this uh, very, so that's one way, that's not the only one, but in this simulation from Richard Parker and collaborators is that if you could start, I mean, in both cases, you could start uh, with something that is very clumpy. So here, this is, uh, you know, on the left part, uh, the distribution of stars and uh, the, the, the red, points are the most massive stars, but anyway, you start with something very clumpy. And if you have um, a dynamical state that is uh, subvarial, then you will have a global collapse, basically, of the whole structures, meaning that actually you will have a merging of all these uh, small uh, groups of stars. And at the end, you will end up with something that is concentrated, uh, that looks more like uh, Orion, it's uh, concentrated, you have mass segregations, and uh, you have a bond clusters. And in, but uh, on the other hand, if you have a, a, a super virial um, evolution, then there is no, basically there is no global collapse, then you will stay clumpy and uh, you will 
keep basically all this uh, all this um, uh, small um, aggregates like uh, what we can see in Taurus. So this is one possibility, you know, to explain the this difference, you know, between clusters and associations. So that would be, let's say, an evolutionary effect. But there is also uh, I think another possibility, and I think that's what uh, we had in, uh, um, so basically in um, NGC 2264, when you want, when you have these massive regions, uh, star forming regions, in, like in the NGC 2264 or in, uh, or in the ONC, yeah, that's the one, that's, you see, the last um, uh, scenario, basically, where you would have, and it, it has been, you, you will form ridges. So if you have a very large um, uh, gravitational potential of the gas, then you will have all the, um, well, the filaments that are, um, you have, you, uh, that correspond actually to the, to the inflow of the gas inside this potential well. And that's where you're going to form all your stars. So you, you're not starting, you're not forming, you see here that's, uh, I would say uh, two possibilities to explain, for example, Taurus would be more like this uh, scenario F and uh, massive regions where, where you have ridges would correspond more to a scenario uh, a G. Okay, so it could be, but in that case, it means that actually the star formation is, is um, occurring, in, uh, is almost a different uh, process inside these two regions, whereas in, the, in what I've just on, shown before from the simulation by uh, Parker, there was, they were saying that actually it could, be, it could start from the same state and evolve differently. But uh, that's exactly the kind of question that we are trying to address here, is to see whether it's uh, indeed a start from the same state and then evolve differently, or whether uh, we do see uh, two different scenarios of star formations. And I think we do see two different uh, scenarios. Of star formation. So one would, that would correspond more for two associations and another one that would correspond more to these uh, stellar clusters, uh, usual stellar clusters, uh, massive stellar clusters. Thank you. Okay, I, I have a coming and a question. The question is uh, concerning the, the, the distribution of the cores, right? Yes. How do you determine the bound character of the of the course is given by the Herschel team, or how do you do that? Yeah, so it's uh, so it's the work that's been done by um, so Toma Nuni, who was a PhD student of uh, Frederick Mott. So she's indeed a, uh, she she worked in this Her Herschel data. So the well, the only way well, we just looked at basically um, at the um, expected. You know, we just. Um, look at the bonor Ebert mass. So mm -hmm. it's just a criteria. You compare basically the mass of your cores to the mass of the, of, of the bonor Ebert sphere. And if it is more massive, then you're saying that actually it's bound. And if not, then it's uh, unbound. That's the uh, mm -hmm. usual criteria that is, uh, that is used. Yeah, because it is a, an important point, I think, yeah. if you know, to know if already we are working with the bound core or not so the the, the, course, yeah. the foreign star is uh, so and the and, and the comment is about ngc 20, 2264 uh, in far i think marta gonzalez and myself we have also yes. uh, a war about uh, the uh, a gradient or radial velocity along the main axis of the star forming region i think it is in some way connected with the propagation of the star formation along this main axis. Yes, I definitely agree with you, uh, Emilio, and actually I didn't talk at all about the kinematics, but it is, uh, if you look at kinematics, then of course it will, it, it helps to understand uh, what's going on in the regions. And um, so, yeah, so, uh, well, right. that's uh, what you did with Martha, but uh, that's, I don't have the results, but here this is also, it's an older work but it's only uh, it's when you look at the radial velocity and different, uh, and you can see uh, again, you see it has different channel corresponds with different radial velocity and you can see stars popping up in, uh, in one channel and disappearing in the other. And indeed you do also see this kind of propagation. <laughs> okay, okay, mm. thank you. Okay. Any other question? Let me see, let me check here. Yeah. Well, I think the, 
no questions so far. So um, Isabel, perhaps we can finish here. Yes, I think I think so. We, not 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 before saying thank you very much again to, exactly. to Dr. <laughs> Sten Moreau and and, thank and you. insisting on in our invitation to to have you here in in real. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Stel. I will I, not forget I, I, this invitation. <laughs> okay. Okay. okay.